just now realizing we all had a good laugh about the flags, but now I have to stare at them while I'm preaching. <laughs> Our second reading continues from the third chapter of Galatians, starting at the 23rd verse. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. By your spirit, O oh God, we ask that you would add your understanding to the hearing of your word so that we might follow with faithful deeds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Charles Blondin was an acrobat and a tightrope walker. In the mid-19th century, he was from France, but he gained fame in the United States for being the first person to tightrope walk across the Niagara Falls Gorge. And after he did it once, he did it a number of times. But as it is in the entertainment industry, once something is done one time, it's not interesting anymore. So Blondin did a number of things to spice up the performance. Uh, and so he did some things like uh, crossing the gorge blindfolded. He did it in a sack. He pushed a wheelbarrow across the rope. He did it on stilts. One time he even stopped halfway across to cook and eat an omelet. I have no idea how. They didn't have video cameras in the mid-19th century, so I have no idea how he managed that. But one time, another stunt that he pulled was that he put his manager on his back and gave him a piggyback ride across the Niagara Falls Gorge. He made it across fine. The story has a happy ending. Uh, but imagine, just imagine, that so you, you're, you're there and you're watching this spectacle and the manager is sitting on Blondin's back and they're going across and then just imagine halfway across his manager decides you know Chuck I just I just don't trust you anymore I'm gonna climb down and I'm gonna go it alone from here thanks for the lift if, if you saw that you would think that he had absolutely lost his mind that he had gone completely crazy and this is exactly how Paul is responding to the Galatians. In fact, there's a great deal of parallel between this tightrope scenario and what's going on in the Galatian churches. Paul says to them, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Another translation uh, by, an, uh, by New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, rather than foolish, he uses the word witless. The Greek is literally mindless. It's not the same word for foolish that Paul will use elsewhere when he talks about the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. That's maybe a nicer kind of foolishness. The foolishness Paul is talking about here is plain and simple idiocy. He's saying, you nitwits, you morons, how can you be so dumb? Having started with the spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? Now, to remind you about what's going on in the Galatian churches, they were formed by Paul's preaching. Paul traveled to them. He shared the gospel with them, the good news for Gentiles, these being mostly Gentile communities in modern-day Turkey. And then Paul moved on, and he went to other churches, to plant new churches, to visit other churches. And when he leaves, other teachers come along too. They don't have permanent salaried pastors to lead the churches. And so these other teachers come along and they say, Paul has done a great job. He's a good man, but he doesn't quite have it right. You Gentiles, you need to embrace the Jewish customs. You need to be circumcised in order to make this uh, complete, in order to really join the family of God. And so the Galatians think that this sounds like it makes good sense. And so they decide they want to be circumcised. 
They believe passionately in the gospel. They want to be a part of God's family. So Paul accuses them of starting with the spirit and ending with the flesh. Starting with the spirit, referring, of course, to the gospel that Paul preached to them. The gospel of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But they are ending with the flesh. They are turning to this other gospel. They're putting their trust in works of the law, namely in circumcision in order to be counted among Abraham's descendants. Now, Paul then enters into a lengthy discussion about the law, the significance, and how it, how it is understood in light of the gospel. It's like some of what we read last week, very hard to understand, so I decided just to skip it. And we come to the end of the third chapter where Paul really gets to the point. And he's invoking Abraham here which is a very significant thing for him to do. Abraham is the father of the people of Israel. It was to Abraham that God promised an innumerable seed, innumerable descendants, a great nation. It is to Abraham that every Jew traces their lineage. It is a part of Abraham's family that Gentile converts want to be adopted. Abraham is a very, very important symbolic figure in this discussion, but Abraham came before the law. And this is really the nature of Paul's discussion in between our two passages, emphasizing that Abraham came before the law. A covenant that was made to Abraham before the law came along can't be canceled out by the law. And that promise, the promise that was made to Abraham was that one day the nations, and the Greek word for nations is the same word for Gentiles, That one day the Gentiles would be blessed by, through, Abraham. This is the promise of God to Abraham. Now then he talks about the law. In verse 19, Paul asks, why then the law? And he answers, it was added because of transgressions. And he writes, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Just this morning, I was driving to church and I had my son in the back seat. And we're leaving our neighborhood and he starts to roll his window down. Um, It's 20 degrees outside. I ask him to (laughs) raise his window. And, and then there was no other conversation about it. But then about 10 minutes later, as we're getting closer, he asks if he can roll his window down. And, and I say, no, you can't roll your window down. And I wanted to put this in perspective for him. He's just starting to grasp numbers and temperatures at school. He can't go out for recess if it's below 20. So I tell him it's 19 degrees outside. Um, we can't roll the windows down unless it's 60 or higher. So see, it's, you know, we're really far removed from from being able to roll our windows down. You see what I did there? I immediately appealed to law, right? (laughs) There's my child in the back seat, and I try to build this very clean structure of law around him. I give him a rule, a made-up rule, completely made up. And he is sharp enough to notice what's going on, and he says, is that a rule for everybody? (laughs) I'm not making this up. And I said, no. And he said, that it shouldn't be for us either. <laughs> so, so I immediately resort to law, to building this fence of law around my five and a half year old son. And of course, he immediately pushes back against it. A perfect picture of the human condition and our relationship to law. And Paul gets it too, because he talks about the law as a disciplinarian. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, who I've already referenced once, he talks about it as, as placing the people of God in quarantine, separating them out because they had failed to live, to abide by the original covenant. But that word disciplinarian sounds kind of heavy handed. It's not the best translation of the word. The Greek word is used to refer in the ancient world to a person who, for wealthy families, would, would watch the kids when they weren't in school. A little bit like a nanny or an au pair, a babysitter or a tutor, someone who's caring for them. And I think a babysitter would be an apt translation because I think Paul is intending to be a little bit um, patronizing 
in talking about the law. I think he's intending to be a little bit diminutive in talking about the necessity of the law. The law was Israel's babysitter. This fence of protection around the people of Israel until Israel came of age. Until the people of God came of age. And it was then that the law became unnecessary. There's a fable, a story told of two monks. And these monks were a part of a, of a uh, they have vowed to forego any contact at all with the opposite sex. And so as they're walking, they encounter a woman. And this woman needs to cross the river. And so immediately one of the monks walks up to the woman and picks her up and hoists her over his shoulder and carries her across the river and puts her down on the other side. And then his fellow monk, when he returns, says to him, how could you do this? Don't you know that this violates our oaths? The other monk replied, I carried the woman across the river and set her down on the other side. You, on the other hand, are still carrying her. There's something about law that is very difficult to shake. There's something about law that makes freedom very, very difficult. And Paul is going to come to the subject of freedom because this is ultimately where he is going with this letter. But with the disciplinarian, with the babysitter of the law, there is no freedom. And Paul's point is that Israel has now come of age in Christ. Christ is the faithful one. Christ is the one, the son of Israel, who has lived in, in accordance with the covenant, the one who is faithful. And it is in this faithful one, because of this faithful one, through the faithfulness of this faithful one, that we no longer need the disciplinarian. We no longer need the babysitter. And it's not just about doing away with the law. Paul does not stop there. He goes on to emphasize that the distinctions, the barriers that the law had set up are now irrelevant to God. He says, as Paul says, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Sometimes I like to think of reading Scripture as being a little bit like rock climbing. Not that I have any experience rock climbing, but I've climbed those walls that try to simulate rock climbing. And one of the most important parts of climbing a wall or climbing a rock face is finding a good place to grab on, finding a good place to put your hand a good place to put your foot. And when you find that sure footing and when you find that sure handhold, it, you can propel yourself upward, but until you do, you're stuck. Or if you grab something that's not a sure handhold, you could slip, you could fall. And there are many texts in Scripture that are both good and poor handholds and footholds. Sometimes when we're reading Scripture, we stumble, we trip up over something, we think this is a firm place to grab on, and we find that we fall because it doesn't, it doesn't uh, enlighten us, it doesn't open up the world to us. Instead, it confuses us, it confounds us, and it challenges us. And other times we come across texts that we can really grab onto, we can really put our foot on, and we feel that it propels us forward. The reading of Scripture is not an easy task, and nor is rock climbing. And this text, this verse in particular from Galatians, I think is one of those really great handholds, a really great place to put your foot, to propel yourself forward. In Christ, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male and female. Now, Paul also writes a lot of very poor handholds and footholds when he talks about women not being able to speak in church or they need to cover their heads in church. Those are some of the more notable ones. But there are some places where we try to grab on to Paul and we end up slipping. But not here. But why then does this verse, why does this passage trump others? Why should this become more important than when Paul says, I don't allow a woman to be in leadership over me? Because these, this is the verse that stands at the heart of our denomination's affirmation of women in ministry as ministers, but also as elders and deacons, as we will nominate and elect uh, both male and female officers later this morning. 
the reason that this verse is a good handhold, the reason that this verse is a good one to read others by is because it taps into the significance of that original promise to Abraham. And that is why Paul is bringing Abraham into this discussion, because that original promise, the promise that was made before the law, the promise that was made even before the exodus, before all of what becomes Israel's story, the promise that is at the very beginning is that through Abraham and his descendants, all people, all nations, Gentiles, will, will experience and receive God's blessing. In Christ, the rules have changed. Sometimes Paul enforces the old rules, the old gender roles, the old rules of life in the household or life in the church. But at other times we see very clearly that in Christ, the rules have changed. And to revert back to law, to go back to circumcision is to claim that the faithfulness of Jesus, of this faithful one, is insufficient. It, to, it is to climb uh, off of the tightrope walker and to try to do it ourselves, this impossible task. It is to rely on ourselves when we've already proven how unreliable we are. This is the nature of self-righteousness. It is to assign credit to ourselves for our standing or our good health, our success or our salvation. It enables and emboldens us to look down upon others and to recognize and point out their shortcomings. It poisons our heart against the grace of God. And the antidote to self-righteousness for Paul is to be in Christ. To be a part of the Messiah's family. Not a part of the ethnic family of Judaism and of Abraham, but a part of the family of faith that descends from Abraham. The family that is in Christ, in the Messiah. Because in Christ, God's people no longer need a babysitter or a disciplinarian. God's people are free. Anyone and everyone can become a descendant to Abraham. An heir to God's good promise. There are no preferred groups, no special statuses. All are one before God. In Christ... There is no longer Jew or Greek. These are ethnic categories. These were the most apparent and obvious ethnic categories to early Christians and to Jews at the time. And for us today, there are plenty of ethnic categories to deal with. There is no longer black or white. There is no longer Hispanic or Asian. There is no longer legal or undocumented for all are one in Christ. But these are not just ethnic categories, they are also religious categories. To call someone was a Jew was an ethnic statement as much as a religious one, and to call someone a Greek was to call them a Gentile, a pagan. And so Paul is tapping also into our religious sensibilities, our recognition of the religious differences that exist around us, and we today draw even more religious lines among ourselves than they did in Paul's day between our different denominations, between our different religions. We determine who's right and who's wrong, which groups go to heaven and which ones don't. In Christ, religion no longer has saving power. No longer is there Christian or Jew, no longer Muslim or atheist. All are one in Christ. In Christ, there is no longer slave or free. These are economic categories. There is no longer rich and poor. There are no longer haves and have nots. There is no longer blue collar and white collar developed and developing countries. All are one in Christ. And in Christ, there is no longer male and female. And these are identities that get right at the core of who we are, of how God has created us. And the law treated men and women very differently. Men and women were viewed in the eyes of the law at very different, in very different ways. They approached God in very different ways. And the church still treats men and women differently. We hear a lot on the news about the gender pay gap and that a woman makes 70-some cents 
on the dollar compared to men. Well, in the church, it's more like 50 some cents to the dollar. Even in denominations like ours that embrace women in ministry, women are still treated in the church differently than men. And I don't think it's a stretch here to take Paul's words and to include gender identity and sexuality. There is no longer male and female, no longer gay or straight, no longer married or single or divorced, for all are one in Christ. We're walking the wire. We are in good hands as long as we put our trust in the one who is faithful and not in our own ability to make it across the gorge. We put our trust in the faithfulness of the Messiah and nothing else. By the faithfulness of Christ, we are made children to Abraham. By the faithfulness of Christ, we are set free from the law. And by the faithfulness of Christ, we are made one. Let us pray. God, unity is such a challenge. Surely as much today as it was in the first century. We have so many things to disagree about. So many things to divide ourselves over. And so we ask that you would give us the courage to remain one as your body here in this church community, here in this town. And as your church, the body of Christ around the world, may we work to find the unity that is already ours in Christ. Amen.